What is going on, investors? Hopefully, guys are doing well out there. That is right. It is the start of earnings season, and we're going to kick things off like we always happen to do, and that is with JP Morgan Chase, ticker symbol JPM. The mega bank has reported their Q2 earnings. We'll get into them, and they were spectacular on the revenue side. Not to spoil anything, we'll take a look. Whenever we look at these large banks, we're going to look at things like average loans. We're going to look at average deposits and not just draw conclusions as it relates to JP Morgan, which is essentially kind of the, the Michael Jordan, if you will, of the banking business. Well, maybe, you know, draw some conclusions for the overall economy. When we come over here and look at these results, this company had, I mean, tech-like growth on the earnings side, and a lot of it just flowed down through to the net income side. Obviously, J.P. Morgan trades at a premium from a book value perspective. We'll obviously talk about that as well. And then we have to look at this from a stock chart perspective. Well, it's deviated a little bit. I'm on a weekly chart. This stock has deviated out of an upper trend. You pull up like a Costco or a Nike, and there's not a lot of deviation in kind of the 30-year chart. JPM has spent some time above the channel and maybe a slightly more time below the channel. But I tell you what, this one also setting up. And we, look, we've been calling this out since Q4 and Q1 of, of last year that there were some good buying opportunities when it came to JPM. Over the last year, stock's up 38%. Year to date, kind of catching a bid with the broader market. We're not just seeing those tech stocks rally. The breadth of this market is starting to expand, believe it or not. JP Morgan getting cut in on that rally up over 10.8% just year to date. The company reported their Q2 earnings. This was on Friday, Friday morning for most people. Revenue coming in at $41.3 billion. It beat expectations by about $2.45 billion. And it was just, and I say just, 34% growth on that revenue side. When you start to look forward with this stock, maybe some more normalizing of that revenue. But as I walk through these earnings, this is a company that continues to grow its revenues by keeping its cost in check. And they're flowing a boatload of money down to the bottom line. Now, the average loans corporate wide was up 13% over the past year, but average deposits, and this is one of the first time we've seen this large of a number, average deposits are actually down. We see on the consumer side, average deposits down 2%. However, they note that client investment assets were up 42%, largely due to the increasing stock market, the rapidly increasing stock market, as we've seen this year. Another thing that could contribute to average deposits being down is people pulling money from a regular savings account or regular checking account and putting it into an instrument that yields 4 or 5% or something like that. I'm in a money market fund right now that is yielding 5%. So if you have idle cash sitting around, could be that contributed a little bit to that average deposit levels down. Now, corporate wide over at JPN talked about how they had that 34% revenue growth. Some of that has to do with the fact that they bought that distressed bank First Republic during this quarter. So if you strip out that acquisition, look, revenue for JP Morgan, just its core business, not including the acquisition of First Republic, that was still up. 21% year over year. We're going to move into FANG stocks and tech stocks here in the earnings season later this week with Netflix and Tesla and next week with Google, Microsoft, and Amazon. And I'd be actually pretty surprised if any of those companies are growing 21% revenue on their top line. This is JP Morgan doing it in a difficult environment. And if you throw in that First Republic acquisition of 34%, more impressively than that, you come here, here to non-interest expense, that was up just 11%. So you grew your revenues 34%. Your expenses grew just 11%. So you better believe that net income number is going to explode up 67% from $8.7 billion last year all the way up to $14.5 billion for the most recent quarter. Now, the company is setting aside a lot more money for those provisions for credit losses up 163% year over year and 27% sequentially quarter over quarter. However, the First Republic provision of that is about $1.7 billion. So of this $2.9 billion, about $1.7 billion of that has to relate to First Republic. So if you strip that out, the $1.7 billion off of $2.9 billion, you get a total very close to where you were a year ago, and it would actually be down sequentially. So overall, though, 
strong revenue growth, strong cost controls at J.P. Morgan has skyrocketing net income despite increasing provisions for credit losses due to an acquisition of a bank that was struggling to a certain degree. Come over here to the consumer banking business. That was up 37% year over year. We're seeing the same thing here with your non-interest expense growing just 9%. That grew your net income year over year, 71% from $3.1 billion all the way up to $5.3 billion, the provision for credit losses. And, and if you're just picking up the story, what banks do, like J.P. Morgan, is a provision for a credit loss is the company company essentially putting money off to the side. So if people don't pay for their credit card or their auto loan or their home lending, obviously a certain percentage of customer is going to end up defaulting. And so the company essentially sets aside money for that. That was up 145% year over year from 761 up to about, we'll call that $1.9 billion. However, it includes $408 million established for the First Republic portfolio that they rolled into the company. So if you strip off, we'll call it $400 million on here, you're essentially flat sequentially on those provision for credit losses. Overall, though, we're up quite a bit. Whether you strip out First Republic or not, you're up considerably on those credit loss provisions. Now, some interesting things here. We get a read on the consumer. Look at your home lending. Pretty much flat year over year, and those interest rates year over year on those home side is just absolutely skyrocketing, even sequentially quarter over quarter, we saw 40% growth in home lending. I mean, I'm laughing a little bit because I mean, I bought a house seven or eight years ago. I can't imagine the prices and the interest rates people are paying now, but you know, look, fast forward seven or eight years from now, you might, you know, be okay on it. And on your credit card and auto, seeing a relatively steady business there just up fractionally year over year and actually down sequentially. But again, the overall thing that we're seeing with JP Morgan, strong revenue growth, cost controls absolutely in place and skyrocketing net income over at this company. You got your corporate banking, not quite as explosive growth on that revenue side, just up 4% over the last year, but the company did a nice job essentially keeping non-interest expense flat year over year. The provisions for credit losses over at the corporate side, very much flat and very much in control. That is going to really accelerate your net income by over 10% year over year from 3.7 billion up to, we'll call that $4.1 billion. Come over here to your commercial banking side and boom, 49% growth on that revenue side from $2.7 billion up to nearly $4 billion. Even if you strip out First Republic Bank acquisition, the revenue would still be up 42% on the commercial side. Obviously, JP Morgan seeing a ton of clients walk through the door as you had a lot of banking troubles at the regionals during this most recent quarter. Now, your provision for credit losses skyrocketed from just $200 million last year all the way up to over a billion dollars. $608 million of that has to do with the First Republic portfolio. So there's a little bit of give and take for JP Morgan. They're adding some to the revenue side based on First Republic, but they're also adding some to the provision for credit losses. Obviously, if they don't recognize this, keep in mind that provisions for credit losses is just putting the money to the side. What you could potentially see in subsequent quarters, especially if the economy remains strong and these businesses pay back their loans. JP Morgan actually puts this provision back in to the profit side. You would see parentheses around this number and it usually does wonders for your net income. We'll obviously keep an eye on that. And then finally, the asset and wealth management business of JP Morgan just humming along up 15% year over year, slightly accelerating on those interest expense but your net income up 22%, very steady business as the company has well north of $4 trillion in assets under its management. And that just obviously gives you a great opportunity. From a valuation perspective, when you're looking at a large bank, really any bank, you can look at a book value per share, which currently sits at $98 per share on JP Morgan. You can look at the tangible book value per share, which currently sits at about $80. Both of those numbers are up about 
14 to 15 percent year over year. The way I would compare JP Morgan is to itself. There's, I think, some people make the mistake they'll look at JP Morgan and be like, well, JP Morgan trades at 1.5 tangible books. So that must mean SoFi and Citigroup and some of these other banks that, that maybe don't have that quite a valuation on there must get to that point. But I just walked you through this bank. This bank has more revenue, more net income than most of these companies will see over the next several years. This is in a single quarter what this company is doing. So it deserves a premium. Now we are sitting at, we'll call it 1.5 times tangible book on this company it has hung out at prices a little bit higher than that anytime you get close to two times tangible book on jp morgan it probably is actually taking you to the top of this channel that's an area where if you would like to you take some profits it's certainly not an area where i would be actively buying shares of jp morgan you're really trying to buy them as they approach what i would call this orange or gold line when it comes down to the bottom of the channel now the, the company over the past 30 years hasn't hung out on this gold line for that much and so unless you're really watching this stock not always going to get your chance at kind of the perfect opportunity what i like to do with these channels is actually split them in the middle and I've got a just a beautiful kind of pink magenta line here that's personally how I would look at this from a buying opportunity you get south of the magenta line and you're looking to accumulate again this is a weekly chart so each one of these candlesticks represents a week of time and so as JP Morgan spends a couple of weeks below the longer term trend that's actually when you want to accumulate more recently we've kind of popped our head here I think I did a Q1 video we'll call it maybe six months ago right at the beginning of the year I think the title of the video is essentially kind of the next stop is 170 that would take you back towards the the highs that we made back in October of last year and if this 30 look maybe maybe now's the time guys that the like 30 year uptrend in JP Morgan is over and it eventually kind of craps out the bottom here I don't really see any evidence of that when we're moving through these financials. So the more likely scenario is that we continue this more than 30 year uptrend on JP Morgan. We make a new higher high. You make a new higher high on JP Morgan. You're getting to at least about 170. You probably have upside into close to probably the $200 mark on this one. Those of you that took my advice to buy the shares back in Q1 when everybody was scared of the banks and running from them, that's usually a great sign to buy a stock. When everybody is scared and talking about how worried they are, that's actually when you probably should buy. I would imagine over the next, we'll call it six months or so, everybody's going to be patting JP Morgan on the back and singing its praises. That's probably when you could take some profits if you feel like it. If you are a younger investor, you're a longer term investor, you're just going to let this 30 year trend just continue to play out because as of right now, there is absolutely zero, zero indication that that trend is going to change any time soon. JP Morgan Bank looking to me like it wants to move back to the highs that we made back in October. 170 is easily the next stop on this stock. And these results, while not perfect, are worthy of a premium valuation that will likely continue to increase as the company continues to gobble up market share from a further consolidating banking industry. Folks, that was JP P. Morgan Chase will be back next week with some exciting earnings videos from Netflix and Tesla. Hopefully you all have a wonderful weekend. See you again soon and good luck with your investments.